welcome uh, to Developing America's Next Generation of Leaders. This webinar is an introduction to the White House Fellows Program. It is hosted by the White House Fellows Foundation and Association, which is also the alumni group of the White House Fellows Program. So my name is Margarita Colmenares, and in 1991, I was living in Los Angeles when I was selected as a White House Fellow. And even though my background is technical, I have a degree in engineering, uh, I chose to serve my year at the US Department of Education. After I left, after I returned back to the private sector, but since then I've also worked in the nonprofit and public sectors. And today I am the Director of Outreach and Recruitment for the White House Fellows Foundation and Association. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you today. We have hundreds of people listening into today's webinar from coast to coast and to listen to this introduction to what is considered by many to be the nation's premier and nonpartisan leadership and service opportunity. And uh, let me just say one, well, okay, I'll say it here. More than 800 White House fellows have served 10 presidential administrations over the past 55 years. And what this means is that in any given year, you have Democrats serving under a Republican administration and independents, or Republicans and independents serving under a Democrat administration. Since the beginning, the purpose, the vision of why the White House Fellows Program was founded was to foster and strengthen future leaders for the betterment of our communities and our nation. And we will be going more into depth on that topic today. So the purpose today of the webinar is twofold. We have in the audience both prospective candidates, those who are ready to apply or maybe are thinking about applying down the line, as well as other individuals uh, who can help us identify potential candidates and hopefully are gonna help us spread the word. So we invite uh, all of you to please uh, let others know about the White House Fellows Program. We have found over the years, uh, at least I personally still run into too many people who do not know what the White House Fellows Program is uh, and should have uh, maybe applied back in the day when, when, um, when they were at the beginning of their careers, middle careers. So we wanna make sure that our message is heard loud and clear. We are looking for people from all walks of life, all parts of the country to apply to the program. I'm very pleased to be joined today by really a stellar cast of alumni. They represent multiple class years, both recent and some of the, uh, I don't wanna say older groups, but that's what's coming out. <laughs> but we all have served the White House Fellows in different capacities, in different administrations, and we all have uh, different backgrounds. So I'm very pleased, as you can see right there on the lineup on your screen, uh, you can see their names, you can see where they're located, and their class year. They will be introduced uh, more in depth later in the program. And I want to go over now uh, over today's agenda. And uh, here it is. First, we're going to give you an overview of the White House Fellows Program. And that's going to include a little video that we put together uh, that kind of summarizes the highlights of what we're doing. You also will hear directly from our alumni panel on their uh, either what type of work they did or the education program or some other aspect of the program. We have multiple resources that we're going to tell you about, both online um, that we really want you to check out if you haven't done so already. And at the end, we're going to have a question and answer session so please make sure you type in your, your questions in the chat box, in the Q&A chat box as we go along. And now I'm going to turn it over, going from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast to Janet Abrams. And, and I want you to know about Janet that she is a former president of the alumni organization. Thank you, Janet. Well, thank you, Margarita. How's it doing out there? It's cold here today. You know what? I think you pushed some of that weather this way because it. It turned out to be pretty dreary this morning, uh, but maybe as we keep talking, the sun will come out. 
That's right. And this is, I'm sure, a sunny crowd and we have a few hundred people online and it's so exciting. Thank you all for dedicating this hour to learn about the White House Fellowship. Uh, I am Janet Abrams, uh, co-host today with Margarita. Um, I was in the Clinton administration as a White House Fellow in the early 90s, just after Margarita uh, served under uh, George Herbert Walker Bush as a White House Fellow. And my assignments were in the White House office. I had two assignments because my principal had to move on mid-year. I hope I didn't have anything to do with it. I don't think so. But my principal moved on. So I served in the White House Office of Communications and of De Domestic Policy. Um, today we're going to, as Margarita said, give you an overview of uh, the Fellows Program so that you, if you, even if this is your first time learning about it, we want you to uh, walk away with um, the fundamentals. And now we're going to begin uh, with a short video that we produced uh, to give you a sense of the history and really uh, the spirit of the program. trying to do is to find here in this country, yes, here in the White House fella, a combination of an idealist with vision and a pragmatist with judgment. This program goes back for 55 years and stretches across all departments of government and presidencies and administrations. And it's an incredible program, and I hope everyone listening will encourage uh, others to apply, to learn more about this. It's something that everyone should know about, even though they may not be a fellow themselves. It's a rich part of the White House tradition, and we're very grateful to President Johnson and those around him for establishing this program. Founded in 1964, this prestigious program puts the best and brightest physicians, military officers, academics, business leaders, and others to work in the highest levels of government with direct access to the White House, cabinet secretaries, and world leaders. Many of its alumni have gone on to greater achievement. Colin Powell, historian Doris Kearns Goodwin, Senator Sam Brownback, Paul Gigo of the Wall Street Journal, to name just a few. I learned most of all how you champion good causes and how you stand up and fight causes that are not good. How you take risks for doing that which is right. And so for me, it was a very formulative experience, one that I've, I've treasured ever since. Year after year, I've enjoyed working with the White House Fellows. Each and every one brings a variety of talents and energy into the government and in many ways represents my best hopes for our future. What kind of person do I think should apply for the program? Uh, I think would be someone who is committed to servant leadership, just as John Gardner would have said. Someone who, who is ready to give back. We expect a lot of you. Expect to go back to your units or your businesses or your universities or perhaps government agencies and leave to set high standards, to set a good example, and to serve something greater than yourself. That's what the Fellows Program is all about. I had this amazing fellowship year. I worked for the First Lady, Hillary Clinton at the time. I think what was interesting is in the beginning of the fellowship, you're sort of trying to find your way and you, you do everything. And then all of a sudden, by the midpoint of the year, someone comes up to you one day and says, we have a speech for the First Lady tomorrow. Do you want to write it? It's these sudden baptisms throughout the year that are wonderful. You feel like you're absolutely not prepared. You can't do it in some ways. And then all of a sudden, you're doing it. And when a year goes by, you can't believe it's over. I think in many ways, the year as a White House fellow has shaped the rest of my life.
Well, we hope you got a, a sense of the program with the video. Um, and I'd like to uh, speak a bit about the history. You learned some of it in the video. Um, President Johnson established the program in 1964. So we've just passed 56 years, uh, which is a rarity. Uh, certainly in this world uh, of having survived and really thrived uh, through so many uh, administrations. Um, LBJ's interest was in giving firsthand high level experience in the workings of government uh, to uh, highly motivated young people. He believed that a genuinely free society can't be a spectator society and that freedom in its deepest sense requires participation. Uh, today, these words might not seem so significant, uh, but um, Jen, if we could go, and, and y'all, as I'm speaking, um, behind the curtain, our wizard is uh, Jen Swanson in North Carolina, and she's uh, helping us manage all of this. I wanted to make the point that in the 1960s, uh, the creation of the White House Fellowship was an innovation, truly an innovation to bring individuals into the highest levels of government. At that time, uh, there were not the myriad fellowship and internship programs now that people um, experience here in Washington and other uh, places around the country. So it was new, it was brand new. If we could go to the next slide. Here is John Gardner. Uh, you saw him in the film and Bobby Dornbos, who was also in the video, mentioned him. He was truly the, uh, the force behind creation of the program and dedicated a great deal of energy and, and care to the program for over 30 years. He was president of the Carnegie Corporation. Um, at the time, he recommended to Lyndon Johnson that an organization be formed to, to select the ablest and most highly motivated young men and women in the nation for a period of service with the government. Um, uh, criteria, intelligence, character, special talents, and general promise. Um, and Gardner went on uh, to serve as health, education, and welfare secretary in the Johnson administration. He later founded Common Cause, the independent sector, was involved in, in establishing the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. He was truly uh, a leader and servant of our, our country uh, focused on civic engagement. He felt the standards of this fellowship would be so high that this would be as impressive an honor as a young person could win. So who are the fellows? Uh, these are individuals with a record of achievement early in career, who've demonstrated leadership and the potential for growth um, at, in their professions and as, as humans, as human beings, a genuine commitment to public service and skills to succeed um, in the fellowship year, working at the highest levels of government. You have to be a US citizen you have to have completed your undergraduate education and federal government employees uh, are not eligible unless you're career military. The President's Commission on White House Fellowships uh, oversees uh, the program with uh, the com its commission director. The director manages the program day to day uh, the commission uh, selects the fellows and makes sure the program uh, keeps to the spirit of its founders. Uh, the makeup of a class uh, in the executive order that Lyndon Johnson signed uh, it called for somewhere between 11 and 19 fellows um, for each class and each class uh, has a, a wonderful mix of, of backgrounds and professions. Fellows work in the White House or in a cabinet department, and they participate as a class in an education program. The time frame is really the academic year, September through August. And I wanted to make a point. You'll notice that uh, we refer to ourselves as a White House fellow from the class of 94 or 95. We name two years, but in truth, the program's only one year. 
uh, but it's just become a tradition that we use the two. Is it political? Uh, this question comes up and the answer is no, it's nonpartisan. Margarita pointed this out that uh, you always have people, Democrat, Republican, um, independents uh, in the program and it does not matter uh, which side you sit on. Fellows are paid, that's an important question. Application window. Uh, uh, for the upcoming class that would enter next September. Uh, it's opened and it closes in early January. Um, there's a review, intensive review of the written applications and alumni are involved with that. It's something that many of us uh, spend hours during the winter doing is reading great applications. Um, the regional finalists are announced in the February, March timeframe. There are regional interviews in different cities across the country, April and May, and the national finalists are selected from that process. The big selection weekend of three to four days, uh, typically in person in the Washington area. My year, we were at Annapolis at the Naval Academy, um, but this year it was done all online, really quite impressive. Um, and the new class is chosen in June. There is a placement week where all the fellows come back to Washington or uh, in this this uh, summer, the selection was done online, but the placement week was in person in Washington in July. And that is to uh, interview around the government to find your assignment. Then fellows arrive in Washington at uh, in late summer. I'd now like to invite my fellow fellows who are here with us today to offer some reflections on their fellowship year. And I know our, hello everyone. Hi y'all. Um, um, we also have a friend on the phone, uh, Carlos Del Toro, uh, who was a fellow in the 1990s. Um, we are, uh, uh, our time is limited, but I wanted, I'll be asking a few questions um, that I hope uh, shed light on the fellowship experience, um, the fellowship year and what it's meant to you. And uh, I want to start off with uh, a quick round robin. If you could tell us um, where you were, what you were doing before the fellowship and what your work assignment was uh, as a fellow and then just very quickly, uh, what you're up to now. Kermit? Yeah, hi, I'm Kermit Jones. Um, you know, they say in these types of Zoom things, you're supposed to check your background. My background is I'm in clinic, so <sighs> really change it so much, so my apologies. Um, so I did the fellowship in 2012-2013 um, in the Obama administration. Prior to the fellowship, I was a Navy physician with the Marine Helicopter Squadron. Um, as well as a physician, internal medicine doctor, uh, and lawyer. And then during the fellowship, um, I had an opportunity to work in the immediate office of Secretary Sebelius, um, got to see a lot of the high-level decision-making that was being made with the Affordable Care Act, um, and then also got to work on some projects that I felt um, very, you know, were dear to heart. Um, got to do some evaluations of innovation related things at the National Institutes of Health, and then also um, work on a program to transition uh, military uh, personnel that worked as corpsmen out of the military into um, jobs that were similarly placed uh, uh, in the private sector. Great, Kyle. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Kyle Shearer. I was a fellow in 2016 and 2017, which was the transition year between the Obama and Trump administrations. Um, prior to the fellowship, uh, immediately prior to the fellowship, I was uh, uh, working as an associate uh, at the New York office of Simpson, Thatcher and Bartlett. Uh, and prior to that, I was a staff attorney working on the Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona. Um, uh, for the fellowship, I was placed at the Justice Department. Uh, I worked for the Associate Attorney General uh, on issues relating to Indian country and Puerto Rico. So uh, issues relating to the plebiscite uh, as well as PROMESA, the bankruptcy-like um, uh, act that was passed uh, 
for, for Puerto Rico. Um, today, I am the Principal Deputy General Counsel at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Summer. Hey, House Tennessee. Great, very sunny. As you can see, the sunshine coming in through the uh, windows. How I is everybody? It. It's cold and getting dark here. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so um, hi, everybody. Nice to meet you via Zoom. Um, and I was at the class, White House Fellows class of 2010-2011, so almost a decade ago. Um, I had the privilege of serving um, with Secretary Napolitano and also worked very closely with Deputy Secretary Jane Hall Lute. Had a phenomenal time. Cannot stress also just the, the um, impressive like legacy that Gardner's vision um, has, held, has held on the fellowship over the decades. So it was nice seeing you go through that, Janet. Um, and before that, I was um, working as an attorney with the law firm Hogan Lovells, um, based in the Washington DC office, but also working in the United Arab Emirates, starting the firm's first presence in the Middle East. Um, and now I'm the founder, president, CEO of an organization called Millions of Conversations. And it really does live the purpose of the fellowship, which is to bring Americans together um, and to transcend divides, to bring us together around values so that we can live a prosperous shared future. Um, and I'm also attorney and have my law practice with Bass Berry and Sims. Great. Travis. How you doing in Washington, yeah. real Washington? Yes. Washington State, where it's decidedly not sunny today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a fellow in 2007 and 2008. Uh, I'm a, a career law enforcement officer. When I uh, became a White House fellow in 2007, I was a lieutenant with the Washington State Patrol. At the time, my job was in the State Patrol's Homeland Security Division, where my job, in part, was to help with the pass-through dollars from the federal government down through the state and down to the locals. And in that role, I was seeing a lot of the disconnect that was occurring between the federal level and the local level and hearing from both sides of that equation about um, the frustrations that they had with that. So I learned about the White House Fellowship Program and was, was blessed to be selected. Um, in 2007 and, and served under the second Bush administration. Um, I was a fellow with the Department of Transportation and Secretary Peters there. Uh, I was fortunate enough to travel the world both with the fellowship class um, and with Secretary Peters um, uh, around the world and the country. Uh, it's a remarkable experience. When you're done, you have access to the, the most remarkable uh, group of alumni that you can ever imagine in terms of their connections and everything um, everything that we could speak of. So currently, um, I was just going to say that I'm a captain with the Washington State Patrol, but as of last Friday, I retired from the Washington State Patrol and am now uh, an HR director for a local health care company here in Washington State. Wow. So that's where I'm at now. Yes. Travis, that's exciting. I want to um, pin, put a pin in that. Is that the expression? I want to ask you a question about your new, the new chapter you've opened. But I also want to invite um, Carlos Del Toro. Are you on the line? Maybe he's unable. Uh, OK, Carlos, unfortunately, has been stuck in terrible traffic on the Beltway. Uh, but he sends his very best. Um, and I know that a number of y'all on uh, who are watching uh, know of Carlos uh, here in Washington, DC. Um, let me go back to Travis, if I might. Travis, you were a rarity as one of the few uh, first responders, law enforcement officers to ever be a White House fellow. And another rarity that you went back to your organization, to the Washington State Patrol, and a state, uh, is that State Patrol, State Police? State Patrol. State Patrol. Um, can you tell us what, what you brought back from the fellowship to your work um, uh, serving the people of Washington? Oh, sure. Uh, I could speak about that all day. The, the one year in Washington, D.C., I went there um, uh, very much thinking I could fix the system, so to speak. And, and what you end up learning is um, it, it's not fixable, but you learn how to work within the parameters of the system. And, and it's it's not fixable on purpose. And the, one of the main things I learned among a whole host of things is that it's really difficult to get good things done. Um, but that's a good thing in and of itself. 
because you want all of this input from different perspectives and you, you want uh, collaboration uh, and you want all of that, that type of um, working together in order to make sure that you have all perspectives on the table. And so I was able to bring that back to the State Patrol. You, you heard uh, President Bush, I think in the video, describing the expectation is that a White House Fellowship Program is a, sort of like a boomerang. So you start in a local community, you go to DC, you learn and you meet and you gain all this experience and they can, you, you often come back to the community and bring that experience so you know how to work within um, that infrastructure and you also know how and who to talk to in terms of getting things done. So uh, that's what I did, extremely rewarding from a personal and a professional experience. That's marvelous. I, I want to um, ask you to tell us a uh, a little bit about your connection to President George W. Bush during that year. <laughs> I, I had uh, somewhat of a unique experience. Um, I, I was a, a mountain bike cyclist at the time, and still am, of course, and he was mountain biking at the time, and I had, um, uh, through the White House Fellowship Program, connected with him. He would ride every weekend um, with a small group of people who I ended up becoming a part of and spent uh, about 10 of the 12 months I was there. Uh, every weekend that the president was in town, we were either at Beltsville um, or Fort, Fort Belvoir um, riding mountain bikes on trails. Um, that extended beyond the fellowship program. I was able to take uh, my daughter to Kenny Buckport in Maine to meet uh, the first president and the first lady, um, and then also go to Crawford, Texas. Uh, and. I mean, I, again, I can speak all day to that. Yeah, I <laughs> just wanted to share with the group that sometimes uh, magic, e even, you know, it, more than the average uh, bit of magic happens in the White House Fellows year. So I know you had some great experiences. Uh, let me turn, I wanted to turn to Kyle. Are you available, Kyle? Hi. Kyle, you're the most recent fellow on our panel. Could you talk a bit about your work experience um, and how you feel it is helping you now in your work, uh, but perhaps how it's helped, how you feel it affected you personally? Do you think it changed you? Uh, sure. I think, uh, you know, it's an opportunity and a rare opportunity for a reset at a mid-career you know, sort of point in your life. It's an opportunity to meet, you know, in our case, 15 other, you know, incredibly exceptional people from all walks of life. And I think um, oftentimes uh, you sort of get in a career bubble where, you know, in my case, most of the people that uh, I interacted with at work or even socially were lawyers. So this was an opportunity to um, meet people in the law enforcement space. I think for some people, uh, uh, it was their sort of first, you know, interaction in a serious way with people that were active duty military, uh, and the list goes on, educators, uh, superintendents of schools. And so I think in that way, um, just those experiences together uh, make you into a, a sort of a new person with new perspectives. Um, you know, I would say that our class is incredibly close. Uh, we do uh, 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 Zoom calls once a month. Um, you know, we've had two folks in our class uh, run for Congress. I think in both instances, we were able to uh, go support them, whether that was through campaigning or being there on, on election night. So um, I, sort of those types of interactions are, are really difficult to replicate. And it's, uh, it's truly a unique opportunity to sort of, you know, reset and gain a new, very close group of friends at a mid-career point. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Summer. Uh, could you talk a bit, a bit, a little bit about the education program that your class enjoyed? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I consider the education program to encompass a number of different components from the trips that we took. Um, we did a delegation to China, um, and we we were uh, that was we were there for about two weeks. Also, we went to Washington State. Um, and um, we went to New York, um, and I found those to, those were incredible experiences for a whole host of reasons, including we, we had a number of foreign policy, national security, and military experts that were part of our class, and so experiencing China um, through those different lenses that were coming together as we debriefed every day, um, especially between 2000 to two, 2010 to 2011, was an extraordinary experience, which has helped me understand U.S.-China relations um, 
um, th across this entire decade. Um, and also we had every single week, we had um, two to three um, lectures with different people, both in the administration and who had, or had served in previous administrations or were public intellectuals or influencers. Um, and, I, and, and every time we would also then have a debrief session and our class also would host salons um, every other week at a different fellow's house. And so we really did embrace the component of the importance of making the most of our fellowship um, from the educational aspects of it and challenging ourselves in terms of like our thought process behind what was being provoked um, by going through those programs and what that meant to us and what we plan to take forward from those experiences as leaders um, after the fellowship. That's great. And you've stayed in touch? Oh yeah, I, I work. I mean, I'm in touch with a White House fellow um, almost every day. I probably would say every day. Um, I work very closely. Um, I we co-founded Millions of Conversations. Um, Jason Dempsey and I did, um, and E Pluribus Unum, which is in the process of merging into Millions of Conversations. And so Jason Dempsey was in my class. We work very closely. I work very closely with Jeff Prescott as well, who started the National Security Action Group um, and part of that network, um, along with Rachel Thornton at Hopkins. I can go on and on but I would just say yes um, we are in very close touch and it's truly a fellowship that's wonderful thank you and Kermit Kermit out um, healing the world thank you Kermit in Davis California Kermit um, many people doubt the the commitment to nonpartisanship of the White House Fellowship Program. Um, I know, I, I, I just eager to hear you speak about it as it played out in your fellowship year, but also Kermit, um, as well as Carlos Del Toro, one of our panelists who's caught in traffic, you all have been um, past presidents of the White House Fellows found Association and Foundation, or Foundation and Association. Um, and so you've had the, op excuse me, that's my corgi who wants to apply for the fellowship. Um, you've had the opportunity to uh, be ex officio on the president's commission that selects the fellows. So you've seen deliberations. So I, could you speak to that whole notion of uh, partisanship or lack thereof? Yeah, I think that's really the core of the program. You know, I think what happens is a lot of people you know, myself included, uh, come into the program. And I'll say I found out about the program because when I was in officer training, I was reading um, General Colin Powell's book and I saw that he mentioned the White House Fellows Program in there. And I was thinking, what is this, you know, interesting program that, you know, helped accelerate um, his career. And then, you know, I applied for it and got lucky enough to be accepted. Um, and so, like many other people, I thought like, oh, the highlight of the program is gonna be to be in the room with these leaders. Um, you know, I got, uh, I think Colin Powell made a, a joke about me, which I thought was kind of hilarious um, at the time. But the, the funny thing is that's not the core of the program. The core of the program is really um, having the types of interactions that, that Summer and some of the others talked about in which you are able to not just network, but really understand um, where these other people come from in terms of their commitment and desire to make the country a better place uh, and how that goes across the political spectrum. Um, you know, I would say, I, I wouldn't describe myself as being excessively partisan before the program, um, especially having been in the military, but I did feel as if, you know, my perspective on things was probably the most likely to be right. Um, but you know, when you start to make these really close interactions with people who you know have the same uh, commitment to understanding government, understanding how we can make our country better, but you know, they happen to be, you know, have a difference of opinion in terms of you know, the politics uh, that could potentially get us there, then I think you're really able to understand that there's more than one way to get to the goal of where you want to get to. Um, and then that played out, I think, I think that experience itself is one of the reasons why I wanted to be uh, president of the White House Fellows Alumni Association, because as many people say, and I would say this is the truth, the, the true fellowship starts after the year um, in the sense that you get to um, interact with a lot of the fellows every single year. I know that there have been some changes with COVID, so um, you know, we haven't been coming into person, but you, know, you have an alumni network of seven or 800 fellows 
across the political spectrum um, that you can tap into, talk to, get advice from, support running for office um, and their other endeavors to try to make their communities and country um, much better. Uh, in terms of how I think that's kind of played out on the other side of that is even still, um, I got an opportunity to serve on the White House Fellows Commission. And that, that was during the um, Trump administration's first um, uh, year in office, so the first commission there. And I felt like my role during that particular um, situation was to kind of help educate these new commissioners uh, in terms of the program. Um, you know, we had just, this was January, you know, when they just started. So we just finished this very contentious um, election, I guess not, not less contentious than the one we just went through. Right. Um, and so, you know, they kind of came in with their partisan lens um, and, you know, we just kind of had to talk to them as a, as a prior fellow and as a person that was the president of the Alumni Association of what the true spirit of the program really was, you know, and whether you are in, in a Democratic or Republican or independent administration. Yeah, thank you. So it's real. That's my experience. I wanted to ask Margarita as well. Uh, Margarita, you served uh, in the George Herbert Walker Bush administration. And was there a concern on your part about a, a, an ideological fit? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I resisted uh, first attempts uh, to recruit me to apply for the program. I should point out, I am a hardcore Democrat. And surprisingly, the people who recruited me to the program were two Republicans. That's how I found out about the White House Fellows. But in any case, uh, after I realized what the program was about, its intent, the nonpartisan nature of it, I really went gung-ho to try to become a fellow. And, uh, and, I, and I'm so glad that I did because even though when I was serving at the US Department of Education, I may not have agreed uh, with the priorities or uh, other discussions, but I was able to give them my input. But most importantly, I was there at a historic time. I, you may recall that I said I was living in Los Angeles before I got selected as a fellow. Well, as life happens, that year Rodney King happened. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, my principal, the person I was reporting to, his name was David Kearns, a former um, CEO of Xerox Corporation. And I came from the private sector to the White House Fellows Program. So that's one of the reasons I ended up uh, being matched with him uh, at the US Department of Education. But um, I was on my foreign trip when, when the Rodney King riots happened. And upon my return, David Kearns was named co-chair of the Economic Recovery Effort for Los Angeles. So my portfolio as a White House Fellows, I witnessed and helped in marshalling, if you will, the federal resources when they want to. They can really pull everything together in a short amount of time, cut through a lot of red tape to bring necessary aid to Los Angeles. So I left the fellowship. I went back to the private sector. And here's where the story gets interesting, because a year later, Clinton was elected and I was invited to come back as a political appointee. And guess what? I went to the exact same department. U.S. Department of Education. Amazing. And so had, had you let the concern about possibly going to work for a Republican administration uh, while you uh, were in your heart and in practice um, a Democrat, um, had you let that taken over, you wouldn't have had all those experiences. It's quite- Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And, and then I got to see uh, like I said, I served under the Clinton administration for five years and was in my element, of course, but I was able really to compare and contrast the various approaches uh, that administrations, and I will tell you, it makes a difference who is president. Yes, and on that note, I want to welcome, oh, Travis. Did Just really quick, yes. Canada, uh, ahead, uh, process. before you go to Carlos, um, we're trying to answer the questions. There's about 100 of them, and we've answered okay. about 25 of them. So uh, great. Keep the questions coming. Uh, we may or may not get to them, but we're trying. So just to let you know. So you're, you're typing answers. Yes. Great. Correct. Correct. And we have, a Q and, uh, we have a, um, an oral version of Q&A coming up in a little bit. Uh, Carlos, welcome. 
Thank you, Janet. I've actually been listening. I just haven't been able to talk. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps that was a blessing. But in any event, for you all. Great but, to see you. <laughs> in any event, it's so great to be here. And uh, I want to thank the many guests here that have joined us uh, from many different organizations. It's just a pleasure to have you learning more about this magnificent program. For me, the experience uh, happened in 1998-99. I was Lieutenant Commander in the United States Navy at the time, and I was selected um, a fairly large class. Actually, we had 17 at the time. And uh, I served at, at, in the Office of Management and Budget. This was during the, the Bill Clinton years. And I had the privilege of serving there under uh, Jack Lew, who was the director, and Sylvia Matthews Burwell, who was the deputy director. And I feel like I really lucked out because most principals sort of go away after the administration's done with. But uh, both those individuals, Jack Lew and, and Sylvia Matthews, continued to serve under the Obama administration for eight years in many other capacities as director of OMB and at the State Department. Sylvia went on to be the um, secretary of HHS and Jack went on to be uh, the president's uh, chief of staff as well. So it was uh, an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity to learn from both those magnificent individuals. And uh, I was just felt, felt that it was a blessing. And, and like Kermit, I actually learned about the program in chapter seven of uh, General Powell's uh, My American Journey. <laughs> and then it was a privilege to serve as president of, of the Alumni Association because you just get to meet some magnificent individuals. Um, there's approximately 745 living alumni and it's just a, a privilege to, to get to know many of them, so. A, que a question for you. Um, what, it, you know, the military is known for teaching leadership. So you, um, an Annapolis graduate, yes? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I knew that, that was a, that was a softball. Um, and uh, you come into the White House Fellowship, but you've studied leadership in a way many people don't study leadership as, as uh, you know, a body of knowledge. Uh, you look at research on the topic and you, you hear from experts, read their works. What new did you learn as a fellow about leadership? But, you know, per perhaps it's a great question, Janet. And, you know, perhaps one of the the greatest uh, characteristics of a good leader is the ability to listen, uh, to listen to others. And uh, this program offers you an amazing opportunity to listen to uh, just an amazing group of individuals. Uh, obviously, the, the speakers that you hear through the uh, education program, uh, through our travel program. You know, my year, we went to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. And uh, <laughs> There were many surreal moments, but I remember getting a tour of uh, of the palace in uh, Cambodia by 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 the king himself. The it, king. it was just by the king. He he actually we, we met with him, and and at, at the end of the uh, the session, he said, "Well, why don't I take you on a tour of the palace?" And uh, so yeah, what an amazing experience. But perhaps the you know the ones that I learned from the most were my fellow uh, classmates. Um, there were three of us that year that were had a military background, and, and most were what I refer to as pure civilians who came. There was a prima ballerina, there was a teacher, there were several business people, um, uh, and, and really listening to their perspectives, right? Uh, talking to them about what it's like to serve in the military, them asking us questions about the, the civil military relationship, um, and uh, me listening to them about what it's like to be a, a high school teacher and, and you know what it's like to be working in a not-for-profit and uh, our class is very close and and many of the uh, the purpose of this program is to learn how government works at the very highest levels to capture those lessons and then take it back to where you came from so in my case it was going back to the Navy but many of my classmates went right back to the career fields that they came from and they're making uh, you know, tremendous contributions throughout society and, and many different fields. So you know, listening to my classmates, I think was the most important part of that leadership lesson. That's great, thank you. Thanks all. Uh, uh, I think um, Jen, uh, our wizard behind the curtain, I think we'll move on to the uh, next portion of the program. Here, hold on one second. Uh, I'm having a little computer issue. Okay, hi there. Okay, we wanted to uh, show you just to wrap up 
Uh, this is the new class. These are the fellows that are um, at work right now. And they had just taken off. The story is they had just taken off their masks that they were wearing and they quickly came together and then they separated. Uh, they distanced and put their masks back on. But it's a beautiful class and they're having a great year already. already. Um, and the program has done remarkable things during this period. Uh, uh, and we can get to that. In fact, one of the questions I think in uh, that have been posed is about um, how the fellowship runs during this year or during this whole pandemic experience. I wanted to uh, refer back to John Gardner for one moment. Um, he encouraged all of the alumni um, to commit to a lifetime of public service. He also believed that for leaders in whatever field, government, business, nonprofit, et cetera, that one of your most fundamental tasks is the renewal of organizations you serve. And we as alumni, everybody you've heard from today um, are, are quite committed to uh, the continuous renewal of the program. And one of the ways that the program has survived for so long is that we reach out broadly across America to make sure the, the fellowship is, the spirit of the fellowship goes out across America to every part of America and that individuals from every part of America apply. And now I'd like to give the floor back to Margarita in Sacramento uh, because Margarita has been focused on that renewal of um, the group of applicants drawn from across the country. She's been doing this for about two years full time. Well, hello again. And yes, I have had the privilege of working with our alumni group. We've uh, been self-organized into different areas uh, that we wanted to focus on to widen uh, the pool of applicants. And every year, uh, alumni go back and they spread the word, whether it's on their campuses or their organizations or the other networks that they have. But this year, because of the pandemic, we've moved all of these efforts online. So this is why you're here today. And even, even after the pandemic, I'm sure that we're gonna keep some element of this along with everything else that we do in person. So here you see some of our alumni in action, actually recruiting and talking about the White House Fellows Program. Uh, next slide. I want to make sure that all of you are aware that we have quite a number of resources online that you should really dive into if you haven't already. And the foremost is our website, whff.org. Over there, you're going to find a vision, history, uh, even a list of frequently asked questions. Uh, you're going to see profiles of featured alumni. And you're also going to see, the again, the layout that Janet pointed out earlier the schedule, as well as the type of questions that you will be expected to answer. And the reason I point this out is because the actual application period is usually limited between November and the early week of January. And if you're trying to find out about the White House Fellows Program uh, and want to take a peek into it, this is where you want to go. Once the application is open, that's the other, the other place you can look. Uh, next slide is the actual White House uh, website where you will again find more historical information about the program and the application itself, which you see a screenshot of it on your right hand side. Um, and that is an application I believe is filled up online and it has some, uh, the basic components of it consist of this, your resume uh, with, an, with an outline, of course, a summary of your employment and activities, some recommendations, three or four, and then a combination of essays, uh, six essays, that range from your employment to your most significant professional accomplishment, your most significant community uh, involvement accomplishment, as well as a memorandum to the president and other details, which are all spelled out on the website, uh, both the whff.org website, as well as the White House uh, Fellows Program. So, all this to say that there is a lot of information that we have created. This is all, by the way, newly created in the last couple of years. Now, for those of you who are joining us today and maybe can help us identify 
candidates, whether it's for this year or future years, we would love to have you join us as a partner in helping us to spread the word. And some of the ways that you can do that is by inviting us to do a webinar like this with you, co-host a webinar, we would be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have materials available that are ready to go. You see some examples on the right-hand side of the screen. These are small um, graphic ads that could easily be dropped into your e-newsletters if you care to do so. But we really want to invite you to please partner with us, help us get the word out um, so that we can continue to have a, a lot of, uh, a plethora of candidates to choose from down the line. So again, these are the two websites to reference. whfff.org, well actually the second one is an email where after you've gone through all the materials, if you still don't find the answer that you're looking for, or even after today's webinar, please write to us at this email, either to recommend candidates to us or to tell us you want a partner, or if you're a candidate, if you have a specific question that was not answered on our website or in today's webinar. Okay, Janet, back to you. Thank you, Margarita, and thanks all. We're now gonna take a few of the many great questions that have been posed by the audience. Um, first off, um, how old is too old to be a White House fellow? Uh, Margarita. Mm -hmm. Well, I've seen the range and probably David Moore has more oh, information. Is, let me introduce, excuse me. Yes, let's yeah, introduce David. You. Yeah, let's let do David do that. Wall and his sunglasses. Hi, David. <laughs> David, um, everyone, David um, was a White House fellow in the 1990s, as Margarita Carlos and I were. And he is the executive director of the White House Fellows Foundation and Association. So knows a lot, uh, knows a lot about the nuts and bolts of the program. So David, could you speak to the age issue? So originally when the program was founded, uh, I believe the age specified was 22 to 36, uh, something like that. Uh, during the Carter administration, they removed the age restriction. Uh, so there is no formal, you know, uh, bound lower or higher mm -hmm. any longer. Uh, I saw on the chat that uh, I think Travis, you said in your class, you had people from 28 to 39 in your class. The average age um, each year tends to be about 34 years old. Uh, the way I would describe it is the program is designed for people who are early in their careers. Um, uh, and so someone who is extremely accomplished you know, in their 50s or 60s and you know, may have amazing credentials but that's not really the, the sort of person for whom the program is designed. Um, they're looking at uh, people who have started out, not, I would say not just out of college, probably, um, but have at least gotten out into their career fields and, uh, and, and begun establishing themselves in their chosen profession. Thank you. The next question is, I want to apply, uh, but, I need help. What are your tips on, on preparing a strong application? Kyle, what do you think? What would you advise people who now are looking at the application and uh, want to uh, put their best foot forward? Um, sure. I think it's like any application to graduate school or anything else. I think uh, you're trying to create a complete picture of yourself. So to the extent that, uh, you know, your various recommenders, whether that's three or four, as Margarita had mentioned, um, that they're highlighting sort of maybe different aspects of, of, of your leadership potential and your accomplishments. Um, I think uh, it's important to start early and be very thoughtful about the policy proposal. It's something that uh, uh, Excuse me, various- could you, When you say policy proposal, could you tell the um, folks watching what you mean there? Sure. So one of the one of the um, I guess criteria or requested submissions is a policy proposal to the president. Um, you know, obviously it's read by the commissioners, not the president. But uh, you know, those are opportunities to um, you know flag issues that uh, maybe you're particularly passionate about. Um, I think in my case, uh, um, 
uh, it was sort of this odd disparity in the criminal justice system as it related to crimes that occur on reservations. Um, this was, uh, I mean, without getting I mean, too into it, um, sort of an Indian reservation is sort of a federal space. And so uh, typically states don't have jurisdiction, um, but states are typically responsible for, for prosecuting um, uh, a whole host of things like misdemeanors or domestic violence. So there's almost a, a, a bit of a gap uh, in Indian country prosecutions because the federal government's responsible for prosecuting those things. And, you know, not because there's sort of racism, but because there's priorities uh, that oftentimes federal prosecutors are focused on, on things other than uh, domestic violence or partner abuse, while those things are very important uh, for communities. Anyway, so. so that's the policy proposal. Okay. And uh, thank you. That's great. And then, uh, Summer, any uh, recommendations for folks approaching the application? I would say know why you want to do the White House Fellowship and really have a plan for what you want to do with the White House Fellowship after the White House Fellowship mm -hmm. and why you think that the White House Fellowship will help um, the experience will allow for you to succeed in your um, carrying out your vision. I think the White House Fellowship is really looking for people who are visionaries and who have that strong commitment to public service and are willing to make the sacrifices that are required to carry that out. Great. David? Yeah, just one practical suggestion on the essays. Now, Kyle mentioned the, uh, the memorandum to the president uh, as one of the, uh, the opportunities for you to describe uh, your approach to a particular issue. My suggestion from a practical standpoint is use the essays in the application to show the breadth of your experience and understanding because the type of person that they're hiring to be a White House fellow is someone who can serve as a special assistant to a senior official in the White House or in one of the departments or agencies. They want someone that they can put at the right hand of the secretary who is going to give them good advice on a range of topics. Um, so my practical advice is try to show that ex the breadth of your experience and understanding of the world as much as you can. So a typical example, I would say if you are a doctor, I would recommend writing about something other than medical policy in your memo to the president. Wow. If you're a military officer, I would suggest writing about something other than defense policy in your memo to the president. If you're an educator, I would say write about something other than education so that you show the commission the, the breadth of your experience and understanding mm -hmm. uh, and use every uh, essay to help paint that picture of who you are and why they will want you to be part of Great, thank you. Uh, so, can I add something to that? So once you become a fellow, then there's the placement week and you're gonna find that the doctor doesn't always end up at HHS. The lawyer doesn't always end up at justice. And, and th this is one of the reasons, you know, it is also intended to be a broadening experience uh, for many of us. So again, you know, I, I think to David's point, give a broad picture. You know, in my opinion, um, when, you're, when you sit down to fill out the application, you have to be able to fill it out completely in all the sections because people will be reading the application and you wanna make sure it is, it is well-written, it is hefty in its content uh, and that it's well thought out, you know, that you have thought about giving some deep consideration to, to the picture that you're trying to paint and capture about yourself. Mm -hmm. That's great. Kermit, thank you for joining us. We see you are on duty now. Um, uh, our, our next question has to do with uh, the topic you addressed, and that's uh, on uh, the bipartisan nature of the program, or you know, the, whether it is partisan. And a couple people have asked, uh, if they do have political, political experience in their background, um, uh, should they not talk about it? Is it better not to appear highly partisan in your application? So I think, I mean, yeah, so two separate questions. I think you should not appear partisan in your application in the sense that you shouldn't slant, you know, to particular partisan 
um, slant in my opinion. Um, but in terms of stuff that you've done in the past, um, I think it's perfectly fine to discuss things that you've done in the past um, in the context of other things that you've done and why you feel that that would um, help you continue to be the type of public servant that you think the fellowship would help you become. Um, and I say that because we had a guy in our class who used to run a political action committee before oh. he was in our class, you know, and he was in our class perfectly fine, um, you know, and, and had no issue with that. Uh, and so that was, you know, clearly, it was partisan for a specific purpose and a particular type of candidate. Um, and I think the funny thing is people's uh, political kind of ideologies and affiliations tend to come out eventually during the class anyway. Uh, and the way that the class is structured, at least the way that I understand it, is they kind of look for a mix of people to put together to build a class. So, you know, they're not looking for, well, in this class, we're going to have majority Democrats, or in this class, we're going to have majority environmentalists or something like that. Um, I think what makes the class rich is having people that you can um, glean from their different experiences and understand, you know, why they have the positions that they do. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, question about the, um, the selection weekend. Um, well, I'll, I'll ask Carlos, what happens there? What do you do? The, like, what do you do for all those days? Selection weekend is a, a truly amazing experience. You basically come in for three days and you're interviewed by the 33 or so members of the President's Commission on White House Fellows. And as you can imagine, those 33 commissioners have backgrounds from, uh, I mean, just very diverse backgrounds in politics and society and engineers and journalists and every potential career field that you could imagine. And they're very, very accomplished individuals who have experienced uh, life in every way. I, I, the most memorable exper experience I have is actually sitting at dinner one and during one of the um, uh, evenings of, of the interviews and sitting next to me was Ted Sorensen, President Johnson's uh, speechwriter, yeah. and I was Cuban American. Huh? I, I, I don't remember if he asked me any questions, but I peppered him with about a hundred questions about the Cuban Missile Crisis wow. uh, and, and President Kennedy. It was just an amazing experience. And um, I mean, fortunately, I guess he thought well well enough of me to pick me to be a fellow. And we stayed friends for many years. Really? And in 2007, I actually ran for the Virginia House of Delegates in Virginia. And he threw me a fundraiser in New York, of all things. And oh. He reminded me that in politics, it's very important to keep in touch with your local priests. And that was the advice he gave me. So th that's just one example of a, a just surreal experience. Yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. A uh, couple more questions. We, we're just at our time. Um, one is, if I've uh, been, uh, if the program has been promoted to a particular group, a particular community or organization, um, is there an expectation that a certain number of uh, representatives of that group will uh, wind up in the class? And I think we know what the answer is, but I'll ask David. Let's say that um, each individual is evaluated and selected based on the merit uh, that the commissioners find uh, in their application and in their interviews. So it's, it's not as though um, there's a, a you know, they're, they're saying we're gonna have X number of doctors, X number of lawyers, X number of military officers evaluate every single candidate based on the totality of their package and their presentation and then select based on who uh, they feel um, has what it takes to succeed as a fellow and uh, to be successful in their placement. Right. Travis. I, I would add to that building on what David said is that the, the, the composition of the class is reflected by the composition of the applicants. So if we get uh, any, whoever applies, we'll pick the best of those folks and the ones who most represent mm -hmm. themselves the best. Interesting, very interesting. That's neat. Um, Kyle, I wanna ask you a question 
uh, that I don't see specifically in the Q&A. It's hard for me to read through all of them right now, but I have it on my mind. You uh, went through a transition, didn't you? Your class. Uh, that, that's right. Yeah, it was 2016. 2016 2017. So mm -hmm. you applied during the Obama administration. You served at the end of an administration, and then you experienced the transition to a new administration. Um, actually, the folks applying next for, if you're applying right this minute, you wouldn't be going through a transition, as I think about it, because it will be the following year. But could you just comment on that experience for your class? Sure. I, I think of all the years to be a White House fellow, the transition years are, are likely the most interesting. That, that may or may not be true, but I, I would certainly think so. Um, you know, in, in many cases, particularly if you're at EEO, you know, physically in the White House or physically at the Eisenhower Executive Office building, um, you're you know, the only people left uh, where there are entire hallways um, that are completely empty. Um, you know, certainly that was my case uh, at the Justice yeah. Department, um, where, you know, when, when the administration changes, if you're sort of in the DAG's office, the Deputy Attorney General's office or the Associate Attorney General's office, you know, the majority of people are leaving. Uh, and, you know, I think, um, I think our class did a great job of, of being team players, uh, recognizing that, you know, we were uh, in a nonpartisan program and we're functioning as essentially career civil servants, um, uh, at least for that limited year. And uh, I think a big part of, you know, my own success and other success is, you know, being consensus builders, being team players, raising your hand to do things that maybe other folks are, uh, are you know, less interested in doing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for me, um, I was asked to stay on. I think three of us actually extended our fellowship briefly uh, by just a few months. And then, and then I ended up uh, uh, taking an appointment, obviously, uh, to work in, in, in the uh, Indian law space at the Department of the Interior first, and then recently came over to CDQ. Very interesting. Janet, if I can interrupt for one yeah, second, there's a great question. There's a great question in the chat that, and David, I may have to have you answer part of it. Um, if, um, how do I go about asking, is a, does one of the letters of recommendation have to come from my existing supervisor? I can't quite, it was that way when I applied many years ago. I don't know if it's still that way, is it? Um. I believe it is uh, you, not required. You can't hear me? Yeah, just you could speak right. a little louder. I don't believe it is required, but uh, the commission uh, would be the best uh, set of folks to yeah. David, ask that question. David, how do people pose questions? Specific? We've gotten a number of specific questions about individual circumstances, like someone who holds multiple passports, et cetera. Um, you know, where do they take those kind of questions? And we need to stress to everyone watching, we, we don't administer the White House Fellowship. We're clearly very involved and our foundation supports the educational activities of the fellowship. And we do a lot with the fellows and clearly we're involved in uh, outreach on behalf of the program, but some of these uh, very specific questions might not be uh, for us to address. Exactly. As Janet said, we are part of a private foundation that supports the government program, uh, which is run by the commission. Uh, so what I would suggest is I, we saw some questions coming in by email. I saw uh, Jen Swanson, you uh, forwarded several to us, including the one about uh, multiple passports. I've already forwarded the, that one on to the commission office to address. I would say the best way, uh, if you have follow-up questions, is to use that uh, email address that uh, Jen Swanson provided you uh, when you registered for this webinar. And just make sure your email address is included in it. And if we don't know the answer, then we can, uh, we can check with the commission office uh, before we respond. Great. Um, Great. I, do know, I do know the initial reaction to the question about multiple passports was that anyone, go, anyone selected as a White House fellow has to go through a, an intensive security clearance process. And uh, she said uh, it, it may be that, that that could propose additional challenges, uh, but still waiting back for the definitive word. Yes, thank you. Um, a wrap up question. 
uh, is every White House fellowship filled with bike rides with presidents, visits to his country place, um, uh, personally led to, uh, tours of castles led by kings. Um, you know, what happens uh, if your assignment uh, fizzles in some way, uh, doesn't really feel right to you, or your principal is not so engaged? Um, what, what happens when uh, things aren't all rosy as a White House fellow? Kyle? Uh, sure. So I think, um, I think in my year, uh, perhaps because it was a transition year, we had two or three White House fellows who um, uh, requested to change, uh, change opportunities or placements, and that was accommodated. Uh, and I think everyone was happier at the end for it. We had one individual uh, who in the Obama administration was working at the uh, at USDA uh, and uh, in the Trump administration was reassigned to work uh, at the uh, U, uh, USTP, the Office of Science and Technology. Um, OSTP, yeah. yeah. And then OSTP, that's right. And I think the only other thing that I, I hadn't heard mentioned is that there is a, a sort of a formal assignment process where they assign you a mentor from a previous class. And I think that was one of the other really uh, valuable things about the about the fellowship. I mean, obviously, there's lots of sort of conversations that happen with the folks that are immediately, you know, sort of prior to you in years. But, you know, being assigned for me, um, you know, Bobby Kilberg from the Nixon administration, uh, who worked in the Indian law space on all of these like really important issues was, you know, maybe the highlight of the fellowship for me just to sort of hear those stories about you know, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act and sort of, you know, Nixon saying it's going to be 40 million acres, like, you know, sort of her being in the room, you know, that's a, it's a way for us to bridge the gap with each other and, and, and sort of speaks to the, the, the fellowship aspect of the fellowship, even across years. That's great. Uh, any other comments? Um, to, quote the famous, to quote the famous um, philosopher Forrest Gump, life's a box of chocolate and sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. That's right. Uh, that's right. And, uh, you know, sometimes the chocolate's a little stale and you got to go out and buy another box of chocolate. So, you know, it's, it's leadership. I mean, flexibility is the key to success. And remember that you learn as much as you do from those uh, poor experiences as you do from the great experiences. And you're going to run across, you know, in any particular agency, you have a principal, but you're also surrounded with a lot of other uh, extremely talented individuals that don't always have the same opinion that you do on, on things and matters. And uh, you're going to learn that, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And right. you're going to learn, um, you know, experiences from each and every one of those. But uh, overall, it's just an amazing experience. Yeah, it's great. Okay, I think uh, we're going to uh, conclude and thank everyone uh, for joining us. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to my co-host, Margarita. Um, and uh, uh, please uh, check out the website and uh, be in touch if you wish through the email address. Um, okay. thank yes. Uh, can we leave the chat open for a few minutes so we can uh, address some of the questions that we see? Yes, that haven't been yes, we'll yet. do that. We will, uh, we'll keep it up now, say for 30 minutes. Super. Okay, we will do that. Thank you, Margarita. Any conclusion from you? Concluding remarks. Only I want to really thank everyone for joining us today. It's really been uh, thank you for your time and finding out more about the White House Fellows Program. And we really hope that you will take this to heart and take a hard look at the program. If it's for you, please send in your application. Uh, thank you, Janet, and everyone who was on the panel today for giving us your time to share with prospective candidates and those who can help us find candidates. Thank you again. Thank you. So the, the, the answer to that is typically when you go for your security clearance, if you happen to have a dual citizen, part of the response has to do with whether you have the option of relinquishing right. one of those citizenships or not. In the case that you have the option to relinquish, they expect you that you will relinquish it. 
There are some countries that just simply prevent you from ever relinquish, relinquishing your, um, your citizenship. Huh. And in those cases, um, they won't be able to give you a security clearance. I, I've gone through that in my company and it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it is, it's what happens. Right, right. And there was one, there are some 50 people still on the line. I, I one interesting question about um, whether uh, foreign policy experience or, or international business experience uh, might not be looked upon uh, favorably uh, in comparison to someone who has domestic experience. My response to that is all experience is good experience. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's what you've done with it and how you could imagine contributing as a fellow and then, and doing more later. Well, let me see. Um, Another, uh, there are a couple of questions about that prohibition on federal employees, non-military federal employees um, uh, applying or being eligible for the program. And uh, someone working on Capitol Hill or someone who's a full-time contractor to uh, a federal agency. Mm -hmm. I know that the if you're working for full time on Capitol Hill, um, you were a federal employee. If you're a contractor working for um, an agency, uh, federal government, uh, in that case, uh, you would be eligible to apply. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's only if you are a federal employee. So, right. and, and, and the rationale for those of you who are still listening in is pretty straightforward. Um, Federal employees have already learned about right, government. Uh, the workings of the federal government. And so right. uh, it's not uh, seen as uh, uh, a wise investment of, of resources right. to. Right. And the founding vision was to bring people from outside government in. Exactly. exactly. Um, uh, now, as for the full time contractor, uh, because I know a lot of people work for con either they're independent contractors or they work for a firm and they're essentially full-time assigned to an agency. Uh, you're eligible to apply, but the, the challenge will be making the case that your experience, that you have experience broader than that. Yeah. Making the case in your application. But, but yep. you are eligible. You're eligible. Yeah. There's another great question, which is, um, I don't want to tell my boss that I'm applying for this program <laughs> because I saw that one. he might get mad at me and, and force me to quit or something or, or put me in a difficult situation. And that often presents itself, especially for people from the business sector that are applying that sometimes work in large companies and, and things like that. So there's two approaches to it. One approach is to, if you feel that your, your supervisor is open-minded and flexible enough, um, try to explain the program to him. And if you work for this large company, company XYZ, that you, you may go away for a year and you may actually, I'm sorry, you may go away from a year and then you may come back to the company that more prepared uh, to be a productive member of that company, right? And, and that, there's that a the, long tradition of that in the fellows program. Exactly. And hope that the supervisor is understanding of it. The other approach, quite frankly, is if, if, if the requirement, and I, I apologize because I just cannot remember that, that you do need to have, uh, if you don't need to have your supervisors, then apply without them knowing, get accepted into the program. And after you're accepted, say, hey, I'm leaving the company and, and uh, I'll see you maybe in a year or so. Well, it used to be, well, in fact, you, you, are supposed to have a recommendation from your current employer. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, it also, but, David, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, um, that is desired, but not required. Okay. That's what I thought. Recommended. Yeah, yeah, it's recommended. The, in the olden days when um, regional finalists were publicly announced, mm -hmm. uh, which, and national finalists were publicly announced, your employer could find out about your uh, successful 
uh, kind of movement through the process by reading the newspaper. <laughs> but that's not so much a risk now because they're, yeah. because- I, I, saw, I, I saw a question about uh, the logistics for the interviews uh, from someone who's posted overseas. Uh, they do not reimburse for uh, travel to and from the interviews, either for regionals or for nationals. So that's something that you would have to take care of on your own. Uh, they also do not pay moving expenses to Washington, D.C. Right. But for selection weekend, uh, you get room and board. <laughs> yes, correct. Yeah. And the placement week. Yeah. Uh, what's the youngest age ever accepted? 22. Pardon me? The youngest age? Youngest age ever accepted was, I believe, 22 years old. Um, and uh, that was back in the 1960s. Uh, does professional experience mean full-time paid experience? I would say not uh, often, but not necessarily. Let's see. We had a poet in my class who did, did not have work experience. Yeah. But he, and there was a question um, posted uh, about academic credentials. Do they count? as being examples of outstanding achievement. And I would argue, yes. Sure, why not? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, the, the, of course, the people reading your application are going to consider that, that you perhaps you focused on scholarship um, rather than uh, working outside the library. Yeah. And a corollary to that is uh, someone asked earlier about whether, you know, if you got low grades in college, does that matter? Um, I will tell you, absolutely not. <laughs> from personal experience. From personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least so, in my undergraduate experience, I followed what the, the John S. McCain uh, uh, form of leadership um, in any event. But it, I, I also chose not to list my grade point average on my application either. And it never, it rarely ever comes up in conversations throughout the selection process. So honesty is the best policy in yeah. general. So yeah. if you asked that directly, you would have told the truth. Absolutely. But, yeah, but um, that's, that's an issue too, is to be careful what you write in the application, because in the interviews, you might be asked directly about it. Be careful copying someone's memo, someone else's memo, or letting someone else you know, hand you a memo to the president that you include in as one of your essays. Because uh, first of all, it's probably going to show upon reading. But then after that, you may be asked about it at the regional interviews or at the national final interviews. Now, I was no, just, I, I was just no May about it. Yeah, I was just yeah, an able officer. If my if my good friend Dr. Kermit Jones had a low grade point average, I kind of want to know that before I go visit him. <laughs> oh yeah, well exactly. Yeah, I mean you, you want to know if you know this doctor couldn't pass anatomy or something before that's you, right, can, that's you right. know which foot to uh, cut on. But yeah, what? I just wanted to echo that. Um, anything that is put in the application is fair game, and they will ask you about it. You know, I was asked about. Um, some fundraising I'd done for a, a Pakistani um, NGO, uh, you know, by the head of the, um, I think he was the editor in chief of the National Review. So yeah, I mean, like people will randomly pick something out of there. So, you know, know your, your application front, frontwards and backwards. Right, and sometimes people are, the, are randomly picking something because they may not have yet formulated a really good question. <laughs> and they'll just happen upon a detail and you think, well, no one would ever notice that. Well, they did because that was the easiest thing to ask at the moment. Oh yeah. Because yeah. there's pressure on the interviewer, interviewers as well um, because they want to, um, especially if they're interviewing in teams and that's what happens at, in the regional and national final interviews, they want to look good, you know, uh, they want to uh, feel that they are uh, asking uh, questions as, uh, you know, as tough a question or as uh, smart a question as their, their fellow interviewer. Well, well, Janet, it appears that we've tackled, I think, most, if not all, of the questions okay. on the chat room, so. 
Okay. I well, we still. A, I wanted to add one one last thing about the question on the letters. I could hear you guys talking, but I couldn't talk, so I had to jump off and jump back yeah. into the, into the Zoom. Um, so in my particular case, I did come from the private sector, from business, and at the time, I did not want to let my employer employer know that I was applying because I was already on leave uh, from the company, and I had a feeling that they would not take kindly to me wanting to take another year. And uh, when I made it to finals. Um, is when I went into the corner office and I said, I've been selected as a White House fellow. And to Carlos's point, um, that's when I let them know and I had to explain what is the White House Fellows Program. Long story short, my immediate supervisor was like, Margarita, don't you care about your career? Three weeks later, I'm at the competition in nationals and I got a personal phone call from the CEO of our company telling me if I got selected, I'd be the first one in that company's history uh, to be selected. So what I did with my letters, because I didn't get one from my employer, is I strategically got one from the West Coast, the East Coast, and the middle of the country from Texas. And they were people of different professions. Uh, one of them was a rear admiral in the Navy. Another one was a professor of mathematics at a, and was running a nonprofit organization. And the mm -hmm. other letter was someone that knew me from childhood. So I really try to paint, as we've said during this webinar, yeah, the complete picture. photo. Yeah, the complete picture of who you are. That's a great and that point. goes to one of the questions that we had about, do you have to have letters of recommendation only from supervisors? And to Margarita's point, no, you can do from peers, from people who know you well and can right. describe right. you and your capabilities well. That's, right. that's really the kind of person. And it's, it's great yeah. that it's in their voice and not yeah. simply a cut and paste of something that's, that people oh, that's, can that's That's the, uh, yeah, the, it's a death. we pick up on that right away. <laughs> Do not get your state senator to write a letter for you or your senator, your, your federal senator, you mean, to write a letter for you unless you work for them and you know them and you were doing right. something. They know, and they know you. And they know okay. you, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. All right. All right. Okay, folks. I'm going to sign yeah. off. Thank you. Thanks, bye. everyone. Bye, bye to everyone. Thanks to all of our audience. Bye bye. Yes,